I want to thank all of you for joining us. Uh, for those of you just tuning in right now, I am journalist and founder of Good Trouble Productions, Rena Nainen, and I'm joined by a wonderful panel. We're going to look at safeguarding sport in a post-COVID era. We know that during this time period of COVID, it has been incredibly difficult for the international community, including the global, the international global economic impact this has had. But what will sports look like post-COVID in the era uh, with technology? How has this changed our sports community? I wanna bring in and introduce our panel. Joining us now is Raffaele Chiuli. He's the president of Sport Accord and the Global Association of International Sports Federation. Graham Stoker, the deputy president for Sport Federation International, FIA, uh, and also Marcus Diaz, who's the chairman of the Bureau of the Seventh Session of the Conference of the Parties to the Anti-Doping Convention, UNESCO, and also Joyce, who is CBE, OBE for, the, for FIFA, and also the Gen general secretary and the chief of social responsibility and education officer. Joyce, quite a title. Did I get that right? Yes, yeah, sort of. Thank you very much. It's a bit of a long title, but it's Joyce Cook, Chief Social Responsibility and Education Officer at FIFA. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. I wanted to double check that. I had so much there for you. Um, you know, I'd like to kick it off, Raffaele, if we could start with you. Um, I want to sort of, if you could give us maybe an update of the current situation where we are right now, and what do you think has forever transformed and changed under COVID? First of all, uh... Uh, let me thank you for the kind invitation and uh, congratulations for having organized such uh, a lovely event. Uh, on behalf of the entire Guys and Sport Accord family, I would like to share our concern, but also our best wishes for the athletes, the families, colleagues, and for everyone who has been affected by the global COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, Clearly, the international sport community has suffered and many events have been either postponed or unfortunately have been canceled. But in spite of the pandemic, the sport community uh, has uh, had a significant amount of innovation and remarkable achievements, especially since uh, many of us have been in the face of uh, remarkable challenges. As we've seen, uh, the world of sport did not stop because of the pandemic. And just as the situation with the pandemic uh, is always evolving, our co common solution have been dynamic and have been uh, fully adaptable. We at Guys and Sport Accord have continued to work towards our common goal of building a better world through sport. So this is in a nutshell, uh, the way how we uh, have been uh, tackling, let's say, the, uh, the situation with the pandemic. And um, I'm sure that I can uh, come back to this point later during the, uh, the discussion we will have. Raffaele, I want to sort of ask you a little bit um, about your organization, about guys, and in particular, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon described your organization and sport accord as kind of like the United Nations of sports. When you look at it that way, if someone maybe isn't looking at, at it from an exclusive sports point of view, how would you describe kind of the, the global community and what it represents as, as well as all the stakeholders in the international sporting world? What really would you say holds it together at this point? And what kind of melting pot? How do you see this all coming together? Yes, indeed. Uh, both uh, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, my great friend, a person I have uh, a great respect for, and also, uh, as you uh, correctly said, we have uh, a great, we have a fantastic uh, melting pot where we bring together today well, actually, since last week, 128 international organization and sport federation from uh, all over the world, summer and winter Olympic sport, IOC recognized or not yet IOC recognized uh, international federation and sport discipline. In short, from the major Olympic sport to the new and uh, emerging sport, but uh, we equally support all our members and uh, all our stakeholders to achieve their goals. 
In many cases, uh, we have provided uh, a clear pathway for our members, for our sport discipline to develop and grow, which ultimately for many is joining the Olympic program. But also we are developing sport accord and guys for, into influential world governing bodies in sport, but not just in the Olympic movement, uh, but allow me to say also within non-sport governing body. You mentioned Mr. Ban Ki-moon, uh, the United Nations, vis-a-vis -vis the United Nations, UNESCO, UNEP, we work very closely with them. For example, uh, guys, when several of our international sport federation pledged their commitment to the United Nations Alliance of Civilization, uh, uh, one humanity campaign, which calls for solidarity, compassion, and unity uh, in the face of discrimination and uh, uh, divisiveness. So uh, we try to organize uh, uh, international uh, sport gathering, but also multi-sport games. Why? For the simple reason that we have to create a platform for our international sport federation to showcase their sport discipline on a world stage. Uh, if you allow me just to give you an example, we have organized last year the inaugural World Urban Games in Budapest. Great success. Uh, 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 our athletes have been able to inspire the next uh, generation, you know, and also to attract uh, uh, new fans. So uh, it was a showcase, a comprehensive variety of uh, uh, demonstration, not only from the world of sport, but also the world of music, art, and certainly, uh, uh, sport. So uh, we had uh, uh, 50,000 people filling the venues uh, uh, in uh, over a weekend. And uh, certainly what uh, uh, makes me very proud is that uh, young people and adults alike took advantage of our practice areas uh, uh, to try new activities. So uh, we had many children from the local schools who had the opportunity to try out uh, new sporting activities uh, under the guidance exactly of these top level athletes, which were just a few minutes before competing, uh, uh, let's say on the, field, uh, on the field of play. So uh, we left them with a newfound inspiration for in this specific case, urban sport. And um, they have uh, the opportunity to interact also with uh, their uh, uh, role uh, models, let's say. But one thing I want to underline, and I conclude uh, what I'm saying, um, it was uh, a progressive multi-sport event uh, which uh, uh, was proud to promote gender equality. What do I mean? Not only that there was an equal number of athletes from each gender, but also equal price money across all the sport. And this is something that uh, we encourage also other multi-sport uh, events to, to do. So we had the great feedback from uh, International Sport Federation, the media, and above all from the athletes themselves. So I just wanted to give you uh, 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 these multi-sport games as uh, an example of what we are uh, trying to do for our stakeholders and our sport federation. And Raffaele, just a few weeks ago, Sport Accord actually held the first ever digital sport federation forum. Uh, among the participants was IOC President Thomas Bach, the WHO Director General as well. What were some of the takeaways from that? What, do, what are people in the sports community saying about how this post-COVID era might look like in the field of sports? Well, the, the forum you, you just mentioned was uh, for all of us a fantastic experience with uh, so many concrete examples, best practices and experiences from all over the world. We have seen how the International Sport Federation can use the COVID-19 pandemic as an opportunity, I underline, as an opportunity to explore new ideas and implement positive changes as uh, demonstrated by the several experts, uh, uh, contributors at our first ever fully virtual uh, International Sport Federation Forum. So we had the opportunity to uh, uh, debate uh, various challenges and responses 
to uh, in relation to the ongoing pandemic, such as uh, crisis management, scenario planning, events organization, and risk mitigation strategies that can be applied in the months and years to come. And uh, in this respect, uh, I see my great friend Graham Stoker connected, uh, and uh, I would like to publicly say thank to the uh, FIA because uh, together, the UIM, I'm also president of the International uh, Power Boating Federation, we had the opportunity to, to create uh, a task force, a recovery task force, and we made uh, great use uh, of the experience of FIA for uh, an early safe return to competition. So Graham, allow me to thank you and Mr. Todd for uh, the great contribution you gave to our, to our sport. But also, let's say during this IF um, forum, uh, we had the, the International Olympic Committee President Thomas Bach and also the World Health Organization Director General, uh, Mr. Gebreyesus, who have underlined how the ongoing close collaboration uh, uh, can help sport to play a key role in this uh, global recovery for, uh, from the COVID-19. So we have uh, identified several countermeasures and um, these countermeasures are being put in place to organize, uh, just to, to mention an example, the Tokyo Olympic Games uh, next year. So that was, uh, this was a great uh, uh, experience. And also, as we've seen at many competition, we had the specific protocols identified like the one I, I mentioned uh, between UIM and FIA, et cetera. And these protocols have mitigated the impact of the pandemic with uh, many of our international sport federation adopting uh, innovative approach, approaches to engage followers, stakeholders, and uh, uh, athletes. So for me, for all our international sport federation, it was uh, a great uh, uh, experience and was uh, a huge learn and share. Raffaele, I want to thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned Graham Stoker. I want to turn to Graham right now, who is the Deputy President for Sport for FIA. Graham, when you look at this, you know, it's actually fascinating because FIA was really the first to implement uh, and to start major sporting competitions amidst this COVID period. How difficult was that decision for you? And what were the factors that went into deciding to resume the games? Well, I mean, I came back from a canceled uh... Grand Prix in Australia, we had a, a positive uh, result on the Thursday, canceled the Grand Prix, uh, thanked the marshals, 1000 marshals came straight back and we started work right away. Uh, reaching out to the World Health Organization, reaching out through our friends uh, in Geis, uh, trying to find out the position of our sport in relation to the pandemic became pretty clear that um, we have a sport that takes place uh, in the open air. Close contact is, is relatively rare. Uh, our competitors, of course, wear already to protect themselves in accidents, uh, protective equipment. We felt we could move forward and do something. So we worked very hard in uh, cooperation with virologists to come up with a comprehensive protocol for restarting motorsport. It operates in two ways. Um, there's the elite level. You'll have uh, multiple testing and bubbles. Uh, so we're all split up into bubbles. So if anything happens, the whole organizing team doesn't go down. But at the national level, without testing, there was great success as well. Protocols developed at national level have been uh, really quoted as best practice compared to other sports with government. One thing I'd say, Rena, um, the, the the governments want confidence. They want a solution. They don't want a problem. They don't want a governing body coming to say, we want to start sport, but how do we do it? They also want his sport back as an aspect of normality. So if we could deliver a confident set of protocols that worked, uh, we found government would listen to us and we could go ahead. We put that into our rules now. It's actually into our sporting code, so it applies to all our federations around the world to make it a consistent approach. So it, it, it's possible, you can do it. Uh, Graham, you know, you mentioned that it's possible and you talk about the protocols put in place and coming to the table with solutions. 
here in the US, you know, we were able to create this bubble for the NBA, but now in the past few weeks, we're seeing with American football, the national, uh, with the NFL in particular, that, that more and more people are testing positive. What do you believe FIA did that could make a difference in other sports? Well, um, one thing is, I think we've got to embrace the fact that, I mean, sport is about healthy competition, integrity, the Olympic ideals. I think embedded in that now, sport should also be about safety. I think we've got to embrace it. I mean, we had a, a remarkable Formula One incident at Bahrain at the weekend where a driver survived. That's down to a comprehensive safety system that we implemented. And I think sport should set up a task force, do risk assessments and, and look at all aspects of sport going forward from a safety point of view. Uh, the other thing I would say, too, is that we're dependent as a delivery mechanism on our national federations. And we set up a, a solidarity program where they get technical advice. They also get help by way of grants to get them through this crisis at the moment so that they're still there when we get back to some normality. Events will happen. I mean, people will test positive. Teams will be impacted, but you can get through it. You can carry on. We've delivered over 50% of our calendar events. In this country, I'm speaking from UK, over a thousand events have uh, occurred during the year. So it is possible. So Graham, as we look ahead, how do you think COVID and the pandemic has really changed our outlook on sports? What sort of mechanisms do you think need to be put in place? And, and are there concerns, you know, we are making it through this pandemic, but what are you concerned about in the years to come that could disrupt sports the way COVID-19 did? I think the underlying point is interesting to see Joyce and we'll hear from her in a moment, but for the first time we found all our stakeholders aligned on issues such as uh, sustainability from the economic point of view going forward, uh, operating our sport with some form of purpose in relation to society. So we're talking about equality, diversity, we're talking about contributions to sustainability, environmental policies. Talking about peace through sport, I mean, in motorsport, we seamlessly go around the world, many, many countries we go to. And I like to feel when we go there, we're actually spreading the ideas of sport, people coming together, communities coming together. And I think as we go out of this and we move into some form of normality, uh, when the vaccines kick in, I think people will be very concerned about seeing sport fulfilling a strong social purpose. So I, I, I think that's an important matter to look at. Mm. All right, Graham, I wanna thank you very much. I'd like to turn now uh, to Marcos Diaz, who's the chairperson of the Bureau of the seventh session of the Conference of Parties to the Anti-Doping Convention, UNESCO. Marcos, thank you very much for joining us. I wanna pick up where we left off there with that question. You know, As we look at the disruption that COVID-19 has caused the global community, particularly relating to sports, you know, figuring out how to resume these sports competitions. What do you think sports will look like post COVID? Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, Rina. And uh, my pleasure to be here in this uh, panel at uh, this uh, virtual edition of the uh, Sports Center's uh, Security for Sports and um, International Center, sorry. Um, well, it, it all changes, it all changes. And actually one of the parts that I wanna highlight is how it changed when there was absolutely no uh, protocol for, uh, for the anti-doping system. When uh, what athletes want is to play sports, but they want to play fair sport, okay? And uh, really the, the, the measures we had to take in the COVID time, it was uh, practically the most valuable part I can summarize on what happened in the last six months is the ability and capability of sharing information among different governments and state parties uh, to, 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 to try to get the best practice and implement them in the different countries. This is basically some, one of the parts that I believe answering your question on how the world will look like, not only the use of technology as we are doing right now, but the importance and the value of sharing information. Because what the pandemic caught us in the sports world was basically not anyone being prepared of. And as uh, Mr. Stoker mentioned, public authorities want sports and all the benefits for social uh, matters and the impact, but didn't know how to, or were some concerns on how to start either uh, 
competitive sports, elite sports, or uh, 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 private leagues, professional leagues. And uh, one of the most important part was the creation and copying the good practices, as you mentioned, one, the, F, the F1, as well as the NBA, were some of the practices shared by many of the public authorities. But it all goes down that by April, uh, May, June, in, uh, uh, I, I say that even when the world stops, not necessarily the threats to sports, to clean sports stops, okay? And you actually had to bring the best out of the uh, fight against doping in sport in the world to figure out ways on how to keep and prevent uh, this uh, uh, doping uh, into our sport. One of the, the most important part was, as I mentioned, sharing the information, using the technology to do so, and trying to get back to what it used to be in the testing of athletes out of competition when it was by April, zero testing done in around the world and not necessarily the, 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 the doping threat was stopped by the same, at the same level. So now that we are uh, into a calendar of Olympic games for the Tokyo games next year, in the next summer, it's all about sharing information, following protocols. The protocols that have been successful today is already ranked in the different uh, uh, policies made or approved by the public authorities from around the world. And I think we expect uh, the world to adapt to a new reality uh, in, a, in a very successful way. Mm -hmm. You know, Marcos, there's been so much focus obviously around this pandemic, but your work focuses on global anti-doping. How do you think that this pandemic has changed the outlook on uh, anti-doping? Has it affected your work in any way? Definitely, totally. As I mentioned, the statistics says that by the month of April, we didn't have absolutely no testing. That means that, you know, uh, to, to the fight against doping in, in, in sports rely on two basic things. One is the prevention, education, okay, to prevent the athletes at the ethical level to, to cheat, but at the same time is going uh, testing and proving and making sure the for clean sports uh, is present, no? But it had all changed. And the, basically today, uh, as the International Convention Against Doping in Sports demands from the public authorities is a commitment we have made uh, so far two different um, consultation process divided by regions to make sure that the expert within each nation, like the national anti-doping agencies and uh, directors and minister level, minister sports level at every country are aware of the needs of actions not to stop at even at this moment, as well as the sharing the good practices and making sure everybody commits to this very important uh, fight against doping in sport, which is keeping sports safe, keeping sport clean, keeping sports fair. What at least wants is to have a fair competition and what uh, it demands is not only to comply to the different uh, uh, the World Anti-Doping Code by the different uh, organizers, event organizers, but at the same time, the public authorities to put policies to make sure that even at COVID time, there are the resources implemented in the different policies around the world to make sure we provide society for with clean sports. Mm. In that focus with clean sports, we've seen technology and the impact it's had in this COVID era. How do you think that'll affect social interaction, the use of technology uh, with your agenda? I think uh, that uh, today is a proof of how uh, the world is using technology to make sure that the uh, uh, international agenda is kept and the uh, anti-doping world is not an exception. The use of technology is there, the implementation to new protocols and new testing methods, as well as new strategies to cover and make sure we are providing the athletes community with clean sport is based and it will be based in the in the technology as we're using right now uh, many it was a very active summer in terms of the different meetings among a uh, world anti-doping agency as well as the international convention against doping of sports of unesco and uh, it, it, it was it was uh, possible because of the use of technology to make sure we are all kept with the, our agenda and make sure uh, we provide clean sport. All right, Marcos, I wanna thank you very much. Marcos Diaz.
Thank you very much. I want to turn now to Joyce Cook, um, who's with FIFA, the Chief of Social Responsibility, as well as the Educational Officer. You know, Joyce, when you're looking at the pandemic and we focus on the health implications, there are so many social implications that haven't been addressed. I know so much of your work focuses on that. When you look at the beginning of this pandemic and FIFA's role, you know, in really informing the public and addressing social issues, I'm thinking particularly domestic violence. How has this pandemic changed your work and getting the word out? Well, thank you very much, first of all, for the opportunity today, Rena, and to, to the hosts. Um, we, we greatly appreciate being invited to join this esteemed panel. Um, like all of us, you know, the pandemic hit us, I think, all squarely between the eyes. I don't think anybody really saw this coming. Maybe the experts that weren't uh, perhaps heard at the time. Um, and like so many areas, it has, of course, impacted sports, as, as uh, fellow panelists have highlighted already. So our first role at FIFA was to mobilize and to understand the impact this was having in global football for our 211 member associations, with many of them severely compromised with football matches coming to a halt, um, and of course reliant on sponsors and, and ticketing revenues and so on. So we mobilized a, a, a COVID-19 relief fund um, for our member associations. And one of the first things which I think I would really like to flag today is to protect women's football. We have uh, shown our absolute commitment to investing in women's football and to growing it globally. We're very clear it exists um, in, in, in some strength in certain parts of the world, but certainly not on a global level. So those elements are fundamental. They underpin the work we're doing and, and the funding to ensure the women's game is protected. But in addition to that, we quickly realized that the voice of football was such that we had an opportunity and perhaps a privilege to be able to help to magnify important messages, particularly in regards to the pandemic. Our president, in fact, met the director general of the WHO the following day after the announcement by them that this was a global pandemic and immediately said, how does FIFA help? Um, we um, undertook a range of digital campaigns, understanding our role to help magnify, of course, the, 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 the health measures that needed to be taken by all of us, as simple as the measures to wash hands, social distancing, and so on. We also took the opportunity to recognize and applaud through our legends and key players in the game, to applaud all of the health workers. And of course, we all recognize and shout out to great thanks to them for the incredible work they've done around the world um, in very testing times. But in addition, we began to look at other areas that we have not focused directly on before. We've been doing a great deal of work um, in regards to building preventative safeguarding measures to prevent abuse of children and vulnerable adults in the game. We didn't start this work until 2018. We recognize we relate to the table. I think all sports, if they put their hands on their hearts, will say the same. But nevertheless, we have understood that and the abuse cases that are reported to FIFA that we are currently investigating. And we uh, are very proud and pleased to have memorandums of understandings with a range of UN agencies as well as WHO. And we reached out to them and they informed us that the increase of domestic violence was a clear and critical issue and anything that we could do to magnify that message would be important. So we worked together with WHO, with the Council of Europe, with uh, European Commission, uh, UN Women and others, to come up with a campaign that would be straightforward in raising the awareness, but would also offer some signposting and basic help to those most at risk or indeed um, um, in that terrible position of increased domestic violence. When we did it, it was the first time we'd stepped into such an arena. Mm -hmm. And to be frank, you know, when I've been in this um, area for a, a very long time before joining FIFA and at FIFA, we were um, quite aghast at just how much multiplying it got. Our member associations magnified it. I think at the last count, something like 40 member associations took the campaign up directly and we worked with them to have local versions. In Nigeria, of course, they called a state of national emergency around domestic violence. And we were really pleased to work with UN Women and the Federation locally to magnify that messaging. So there are a range of areas that we've been able to magnify the social responsibility elements that of course impact football, sports, but more widely. So, so it's been a good learning for us and ways we can step into this arena more together with other sports and other entities. 
And I think we'll see that we, well, I, I'm sure that we will do that increasingly as we go forward. And, uh, you know, it was the first time we'd done it that stepped into that main arena in such a, a, a loud way. But, I, you know, I think it was the right thing to do. And we've certainly um, seen that message magnified, probably from an entity that reaches a different um, geography of, of individuals and, uh, and also perhaps that would not automatically be recognised as, as standing against domestic violence. Mm. You mentioned, Joyce, that this is the first time you've stepped into that arena. How hard is it to make a decision to come out? You know, your whole focus is on social issues, but some people would say when you have an organization as big as FIFA, there's also some risk attached to that. Uh, it's a really good question. And, you know, of course, we had discussions internally. Um, you know, on a personal level, I'm very grateful, and, and as FIFA, that we have a president who fully understands these issues. I report directly into the president's office. Um, he's very mindful of, of our responsibilities in this area, in football, of course, um, but the opportunity our voice has more widely. You know, we are the first to say we are not perfect at FIFA. We are working very hard in all of these areas, and we are determined to keep increasing our focus. So, it wasn't a very difficult discussion internally. Um, you know, it, it, it's, um, it's one that took place, of course it did, um, but it, it was a, an easy step to, to, to take this opportunity. And of course, the results have made it clear to us we can and should do more of this going forward. And there's a program that FIFA has launched called Safe Home. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that is? Yeah, so this was the actual campaign we did. We called it Safe Home, and it was a digital campaign that um, worked together with our legends uh, very deliberately with players that have spoken out in this arena. We, of course, want to be very careful who speaks to these messages um, and that we knew um, were already working in their own countries or, or wherever in this regard. And the messaging that was created was done working closely with WHO's um, domestic violence experts and together with UN Women and others to make sure we got the messaging right. Um, so that that's the campaign I was talking about. Forgive me for not saying it was safe home. Um, but as I say, it's taught us some good lessons about what we can further magnify going forward. When you look at your role at FIFA overseeing social responsibility and education, where have you seen the greatest strides in your campaigns? That's, a, that's another very good question. You know, I, I think I'd like to answer that based on my experiences in the last 20 years or more um, working in this sector, in the NGO sector before coming to FIFA and being at FIFA. Um, but, you know, we, we are working intently around our, our, our flagship tournaments to embed human rights, values, responsibilities as, as, as the hosts, um, but together as well in our bidding processes so that uh, appointed hosts of our tournaments understand their obligations in this regard. So we've embedded human rights, uh, workers' rights. Um, we're very um, thankful to the Qatari authorities for the Abol uh, uh, abolition of the kafala system most recently. We're working intensely with our uh, delivery partner, the Supreme Committee, to embed workers' rights across a broader spectrum than the stadium construction sites. And not only where FIFA is directly involved, but we've been doing capacity building programs with hotel chains, security services, and so on. So the work we're doing in that regard is important. Some of the environmental um, innovations that are coming out of Qatar, I have no doubt personally will uh, be magnified and picked up um, by other sports and we, you know, we're very pleased to work across all sports in this regard and to see the same developments happening in other sports. Um, in regards to anti-discrimination, we're all very mindful of the Black Lives Matter movement that happened as, as a key, um, you know, I think when we all look back and reflect, we will remember that uh, movement uh, very clearly and our responsibility in that regard as well we have a zero tolerance to any form of z uh, discrimination and we want to continue to magnify that we're currently working I probably shouldn't say this on air but we're currently working on further campaigns to to magnify that hoping to launch early next year and all of the elements sexism homophobia all of these areas in football that we have work to do in and of course more widely in society and lastly the work that we are doing in terms of safeguarding through our fifa guardians program and preventative measures to protect children and vulnerable adults in sports 
you know, we, we um, recently called for a new entity. Um, we are now working on launching the consultation process for that entity, a multi-sports, multi-government entity focused specifically on this area based on the experience we have faced and the challenges in the high profile cases such as in Afghanistan and now in Haiti and, and doing the job that sports rightly needs to do to um, ban perpetrators, to eradicate this abuse, but sometimes having to do that in very challenging environments where we can't always rely on the statutory agencies, the child protection and criminal authorities locally as sports to help us to do that. So that's another really exciting prospect that's on the horizon. Um, we believe it's really needed. We've had pre-consultation with a range of sports um, together with governments. Our president, again, leads this and is speaking to heads of states. And we think this will be the next step because, you know, it is a serious, serious issue in sports and in wider society. And we understand the role we need to play in that. And it's been a, a really important uh, reaching out to other sports to realize they have the same challenges as us and all of us want to work together, which can only be a good thing. That's such a great point, Joyce, especially reaching out to other sports entities. Uh, very powerful. I want to thank you very much, Joyce Cook with FIFA. Uh, you know, we've got a few more minutes left, and I'd like to, to turn back around to the panel to sort of the focus of this panel was kind of sports in a post-COVID era. I want to turn back to Raffaele. Raffaele, when you look at, in the coming year, how do you see, you know, we've got great hopes on these vaccines that are coming out. Uh, it'll take time for those vaccines to get out and get distributed. Where do you see sports over the next year to 18 months headed? for uh, this very interesting question. Uh, first of all, uh, we have to say what we have been doing and uh, uh, many of our international sport federation with our full support, we, they have organized innovative webinars, virtual workshop and allow me to say also virtual competition, e-sport, you know, this was something that uh, um, is, uh, is, uh, is an area where we are focusing on. And uh, certainly this means resilience, this means flexibility that our community has shown in the face of the pandemic. So basically adaptation, we have adapted. And certainly we have continued to deliver the best that we could for uh, our members, for our athletes, and certainly for our fans. So <clears throat> it has not been easy and it will not be easy, but certainly, uh, we are working with our maxim maximum uh, uh, commitment, passion, and uh, energy. And um, uh, I do believe that sport has remained a beacon of hope and so much more throughout the pandemic. We don't have to forget this. And uh, certainly, uh, to answer your question, the pandemic has also required more than hope. So uh, <clears throat> we have uh, engineered uh, a practical solution to try to do our best to change people's life for the better. And uh, we have delivered this. Uh, when, we, uh, when the first wave hit and the first lockdown became our new reality, sport was there to make our daily lives healthier and more tolerable with our sporting heroes, as uh, Joyce was uh, saying, you know, in the case of, uh, of FIFA, we had quite a few giving their guidance, their encouragement to keep uh, all of us active uh, in, our, uh, in our own homes. So we shared inspirational moments, which we'll never forget. And um, certainly uh, uh, with uh, the exercise being uh, one of the only legitimate reason to leave the house, we saw a big growth, for example, in running, in uh, cycling, outdoor swimming, and many others. So uh, Graham before was mentioning uh, the bubbles, you know, since the first lockdown, uh, uh, the success of the bubbles in many professional sports showed that it was possible to resume uh, certain activities uh, safely. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we need to, we don't need to underestimate the financial impact that uh, uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, had and will have 
on uh, on the world of uh, of uh, sport. So uh, the IOC uh, played the key role in this, but also the Swiss federal government, for example, and all the can cantonal authorities uh, to allow the sport movement to continue to play its uh, crucial role in the society. And um, uh, we had many, many examples, but at the moment, to go back to your point, you know, to your question, we have uh, many common challenges. For example, lack of access to training facilities, athlete mental health. So we don't have just to focus on the physical health of our athletes. Uh, there are clear issues with uh, mental health. Uh, Marcos was mentioning all the challenges related to anti-doping. This is a key issue for us as well. But uh, also, we don't have to forget uh, the travel restrictions because uh, the travel restrictions are uh, creating a lot of problems, uh, you know. So what we are trying to do and what we will do more and more is to share the key lessons, you know, and shining a spotlight on the best practice. Uh, I want to give you a couple of examples. Uh, some of the greatest, the greatest pole vault athletes competed against one another from their own back gardens. You know, they call it uh, the ultimate garden clash. Or for example, we have our colleagues uh, connected with us today of the World Taekwondo. I have the great respect for this federation and for uh, their president, Dr. Chu. What they've done, they launched the digital campaign, uh, kick uh, 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 king at home to show how fighters are coping with the global situation. You know, this is a combat sport, so they had challenge. Another example, World Archery, they, learned, they launched the first remote archery competition, lockdown, knockdown. So these are just a few examples of uh, how, you know, the sport, is, uh, the sport community mm -hmm. has uh, adapted uh, and uh, also uh, has entertained and engaged uh, their their funds. So I am very much uh, encouraged to see, you know, uh, uh, this uh, common goal of utilizing the power of sport as a symbol of uh, positivity, hope, and allow me to say unity as well. So Tokyo 2020 done in 21 will be a great uh, uh, moment for, uh, I, I hope it will be an incredible celebration of, for the whole uh, uh, humanity. And uh, certainly we are working with the IOC in that uh, respect. Um, Joyce just mentioned uh, uh, a key point and I conclude sustainability. Sustainability is a topic which is close to my heart. It represents much of my life's work, both outside and uh, 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 within the sport. And um, uh, we have uh, recently announced at Guys the Sustainability Award for 2020 with the World Sailing uh, taking the top uh, prize and World Rugby and International Volleyball Federation uh, came uh, in second and third uh, uh, place. We had the, the honor uh, to have with us uh, uh, his uh, Serene Highness, the Solid oh. Prince uh, Albert uh, II of Monaco, which is uh, a great uh, uh, fan and uh, a great leader in uh, uh, sustainability. So uh, sustainability is not uh, about empty words and promises. It is about turning words into meaningful, credible action and uh, inspiring uh, others to do the same. And uh, the people who know me, they know that uh, I do walk uh, uh, the talk. So let me conclude by saying that sport showed once again how it can bring communities together and help us to focus on the beauty of team effort, on the lessons of winning and losing with grace and fair play. Lessons that I believe are more important now than ever. As individual members of our sport family, we are all drops of water, some larger and some smaller. But together, we are an ocean. Together, we are much stronger. All right, Raphael, I wanna thank you very much. Graham, I'd like to turn to you. I, I wanna sort of also, Raphael sort of did a great job pointing out 
uh, you know, how cohesive this has been for so many people in the sense of we've been united through this pandemic. But when you look at the financial implications of how this pandemic has affected the sports community, um, you know, I, I know you represent um, FIFA, um, excuse me, FIA, but when you look at how you guys have been able to sort of pick up and move much quicker than a lot of other sports, what do you think the long-term economic repercussions might be to sports? Well, again, I'm trying to look at the positive uh, consequences of this. And for many years, we've been debating sustainability in uh, our world of motorsport issues, such as uh, cost restrictions. All of a sudden, as a consequence of the pandemic, we've now got that in place. We've got a cost cap in place in Formula One, by way of example. Everybody's talking about sustainability going forward. Um, if I can just pick up on what Raffaele said as well, I mean, my, my endearing memory of this period now is going to be the solidarity between the international federations and some of the other big players, World Health Organization. But I mean, for instance, we've reached out and forged links with the Red Cross. All, all our national federations are working with the Red Cross. So I see us coming out of this uh, really with a positive message. I have to say I'm optimistic. I think sport's not only going to be popular back, there's going to be huge interest, but I think it's going to be delivering on social responsibility commitments. It's going to have a purpose, uh, absolutely on sustainability, but a whole range of other things as well. So as I say, I'm, I'm optimistic. Mm -hmm. And Graham, when you look sort of at what we've learned during this period under COVID and the testing, a lot of people I know when you look at a tragedy like 9-11, a lot of people say it was a lack of uh, imagination in the intelligence community of understanding something like this could happen. When you look at the imagination that's needed in the sports community, what are the other things that maybe you can't predict? We didn't see this coming for so many people as Joyce pointed out. Um, what are you worried about in the years to come, knowing what we've gone through in this pandemic to secure sports? Well, uh, to be specific, I mean, we're involved in crystal ball gazing there, aren't we? Well, what I think that we need to do is to be flexible so we can deal with these problems when they come. I mean, the big issue on my desk in front of me now is sustainability and issues such as climate change and the impact on the environment. Um, Raphael has pioneered this for years, and I'm, I'm next to him on this. I think it's so important. Uh, we're working, obviously, right across all of our championships, trying to deliver sustainable drivetrains so that we make a contribution to uh, the mobility of society in an environmentally sustainable way. We're looking at e-fuels. We're looking at a whole range of things there. Um, sport has got so much power to deliver good. And uh, I think going forward, if we're flexible, uh, if we deal with crisis management in the way we have, and I think we've dealt with this remarkably well, I think we can deal with anything that will come our way. Joyce, uh, I know both Graham and Raffaele have spoke about sustainability. We talk about climate change, for instance. I was just curious, is that something that FIFA is looking at as well? Yes, thank you very much. And, and, and you know, we, these are these are questions to my heart, but, but fundamental. And I think the panelists uh, have, have have underlined that COVID, if anything, has taught all of us the values of this. But I think we have to say this with a note of caution, that we make sure that we now deliver on 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 those pledges. And, and that, of course, uh, is the challenging part. And we already embed in our bidding requirements elements such as the need for uh, sustainable uh, tournaments for ensuring protection of the climate, environmentally friendly uh, building constructions, um, meeting the international standards, that's a requirement of our host for our uh, flagship events, um, and indeed so much more. And, you know, I think, as I mentioned earlier, the some of the innovative technologies that are coming out of Qatar are really exciting, including the stadium that will be deconstructed at the end and moved. You know, none of us know yet quite how uh, sustainable that will be in ter terms of the environmental climate change footprint and the studies that will go on around that I think will be important for all sp sports and the lessons we can learn but but I think more broadly we we are understanding ever more the importance this is to the fans to sponsors you know our own sponsors and those that we're speaking with currently for future opportunities 
this is now at the top of their list of priorities, which is fantastic to see and something we're really pleased to embrace. But as sports, you know, I think we've said not only in our own sports, but in connecting so much more with each other. And, you know, we've we've learned so many lessons in reaching around out around the entity we're calling for around uh, abuse cases in sports, how much stronger we are together as sports, talking day to day to one another. Of course, you know, relying on um, the, the entities that exist, such as the IOC and, uh, of course, Raphael's organization and others, but but also day to day, you know, picking up the phone to our counterparts in another sports and helping each other as well. You know, we are privileged as football, as some of my colleagues at this table, to be amongst the wealthiest sports globally and taking that responsibility and understanding how that can resonate with other sports that are not, you know, don't have that privilege, but nevertheless, um, you know, um, deliver really important sports that many enjoy. So I think there's a lot of learnings we can take. And I think for sure, there is no turning back from this now. This will become increasingly, you know, the, the forefront um, of, of everything that we do. And, and uh, long may that continue. Mm, it's such a great point that there is absolutely no turning back from this point. And, and people are so aware, Joyce, you're absolutely right. Marcus, I want to turn to you. I know you focus on anti-doping, but there's been so much emphasis on this pandemic and health issues. You mentioned technology and about testing um, and how difficult that has been. Can you give us a sense, has this pandemic uh, helped you rethink that technology in any sense? Have you changed the way you operate? Well, of course, pandemic have brought, as the rest of the panelists have mentioned very well, um, have brought uh, creativity, as well as two major things that sports have brought and shown to the world is the capability of adaption and collaboration. And these two values have been very important to reinstall uh, anti-doping system in these particular times, adaption and the collaborative part. And I believe that uh, sports have shown in his adaption and, uh, and, and, and what we see today, sports being active in the TV and all over the world is, is the inspiration for those parts of sports that might have some other type of consequences like grass, grassroots sports at a, a beginning level, the development level, are those ones that might not have the possibility of having the resources to have a bubble in case of uh, the team sports. But I believe that what is happening, what sports have shown today, as Rafael really mentioned, is an inspiration, is a hope, and, uh, and that uh, by, by the proper moment, then those grassroots levels and development levels of sports will definitely uh, get back to active, full activity. And uh, in the anti-doping system, of course, I believe that no, no any particular sector of the world have not get the chance of bringing creativity and adaption and the use of the resources that might, you, know, you might not use it as much in the past that are there and now are in the hands. And we are all aware of how many benefits we can do to provide our eff effective uh, work in what we do. And anti-doping system has not been the exception. And uh, we believe that uh, the inspiration part that sports brings really impacts everyone, including the anti-doping system itself. Mm, yeah, you know, there are so many issues that have been such the forefront. Anti-doping is one of them with sports and, and how this pandemic has, uh, I, it's good to see the work continues, even though we haven't heard a lot uh, because we've been so focused on this issue. We've got a few minutes left. I'd love to just go around and get some uh, parting thoughts from you on the issue of, as we, we entered this panel, was really about safeguarding sport in the post-COVID era. We're still in this current COVID era and unsure when we'll fully emerge out of it, um, but there is some light with these vaccines that we're hearing about. You know, Raffaele, I wanna start with you. Where do you see us going in this post-COVID era when it comes to sports? What is your vision and your outlook? It's in line with what um, uh, my colleagues at the panel said uh, in, uh, in some way, Joyce, Graham, uh, and Marcus. Um, we do not need uh, to reinvent the wheel. We just need uh, to create a platform to uh, share good and best practices and to learn uh, 
from many lessons and many things we didn't do right. I mean, I'm the first to, to admit because uh, it was a learning by doing exercise. So I will have the Olympic summit uh, soon in, uh, on the 10th of December. Mr. Infantino, the president of FIFA will be, will be there. And I will have the opportunity to share some of the uh, uh, great things that uh, FIFA uh, has done and Joyce uh, outlined. As far as the FIA, uh, I only have to say thanks to this federation because uh, uh, they lead the way, they strive for excellence, particularly in the area of uh, safety and security. And what I do like about FIA and Graham Stoker can, uh, is, a, is a great uh, 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 witness of that. Um, they are not jealous of their learnings. They are prepared to share with other international sport federation when we at the UIM have been knocking at their door to access medical expertise, uh, you know, uh, 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 to develop new standards, let's say, within the new situation, they've been very much open to, uh, uh, to give us uh, what they've uh, so far done and uh, successfully achieved. As far as the anti-doping is uh, one of our uh, uh, main areas of focus, we want uh, a clean uh, uh, sport community, and we want to protect clean sport and clean athletes. So working uh, hand in hand with uh, UNESCO, you know, I'm part of the permanent uh, uh, consultative uh, uh, council, you know, at uh, UNESCO, we are working with uh, uh, Philip Wurt and his team, you know, on uh, uh, several issues, including good governance and fight against, uh, against doping. Also, this is an area where we need to join forces now more than, uh, uh, than ever, you know, uh, with WADA, uh, with ITA, the International Testing Authority, and certainly with NGOs uh, like, um, like uh, UNESCO. So I'm very much open and I take the opportunity to invite uh, uh, all the uh, panelists, uh, let's say, to continue our open and constructive discussion beyond this forum. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, Graham, we've just got a few moments left. Maybe if you can each give us just maybe 20, 30 seconds of your takeaway. Yep, very quickly. Uh, I think there's a huge appetite for sport to come back. Uh, as I said, governments want it. Um, for me, three points. Responsible, we come back responsible, dealing with the issues that Joyce and I have talked about and Raphael has talked about so social responsibility. I think we bring that in a sustainable way and that includes economic sustainability as well as our impact on the environment and wider, and, uh, wider issues. And I think finally, we come out of this with solidarity. And I think if we do that, sport's gonna be strong. Mm, solidarity, what a great point. Marcus, I'd love to turn to you for your final thoughts. Thank you, Rima. I mean, uh, it is to guarantee the integrity of sports, in all related threats that we may have, violence, racism, doping, it is, a, it is a commitment from all the sectors, from all stakeholders. And I believe that uh, it is the intention of everyone involved in the sports world to guarantee its integrity and the positive value it provides to society. So I think uh, we all will keep committed and have this opportunity to be stronger than ever to guarantee that what is pro uh, all the positive that sports brings to our children, to our youth, to our society. And thank you very much for letting us uh, share our uh, uh, comments here. Thank you very much, Marcos. And Joyce, we're gonna let you have the final word. Thank you, that's very kind. And thank you once again for the opportunity today. And it's great to meet everybody. And I agree with it, stay in contact. You know, I think sports is many things to many people from the grassroots to the elite. And of course, our focus very often is on the elite end of the game, but we must never forget. And uh, our humanity is everything. And if uh, COVID has taught us anything, it's that. And that's that sports touches lives in very different ways. It can be literally life-changing. And if we hold that to our hearts in all the work that we do, whoever we are, whatever our role is in sports, then I think we won't go far wrong, but we have to remember it's about humanity and every single little boy and girl who wants to hold the World Cup or win the Grand Prix or whatever it might be. And if we do that, then I think we're in a good shape going forward. 
It's a, a beautiful way to end a choice. Humanity is everything. Thank you so much. On that note, we're going to leave it there. I want to thank everybody for joining us and kicking off our conference. And I'd like to remind everyone, our next panel is going to take place with Michael Hirschman. It's going to be also on sport integrity. I hope you'll join us there next. Thank you.